Can't believe that it was barely a year ago when we got that first reveal trailer for Phantom Fury, the sequel or successor or whatever we're calling it to 2018's Ion Fury. With a pretty awesome video showing off some familiar looking weapons, stylish visuals and even a cameo by John Blade himself, it was hard to not be impressed. But then, like a lot of other people, I played the public demo they released during Realms Deep, and in an instant, all of my hopes and dreams were lost, like tears in rain. So you can understand why I'd be even more apprehensive when they announced not soon after that that the full version was only months off being released as well, which seemed kind of odd given the very shoddy state of that early demo. Either way though, Phantom Fury is finally here, the third FPS released by Slipgate Ironworks this year in almost as many months, and I am happy to say that things have improved a great deal since that original build. Yes! And if Iron Fury was a Duke Nukem 3D total conversion, well, then that makes Phantom Fury a Half-Life 1, or a Half-Like as I've seen them called. Now I'm not too sure I first heard the term half-like, but I think it's an important distinction to make, simply because calling something a boomer shooter just based on the camera perspective and the fact you shoot things isn't entirely accurate here. And while you will still be running around and shooting bad guys with shotguns and missile launchers, this is a game that focuses more on world building, controlled movement, and utilizing control methods like sprinting and crouching, you know, as opposed to bunny hopping around and circle strafing. Which really in that way makes it have a lot more in common with Valve's 1998 classic. And truly too, like the sheer amount of comparisons you can make to Half-Life 1 and 2 here are just too many to count. For instance, the whole opening level is very similar to the beginning of Half-Life. Phantom Fury opens up with Shelly being brought out of cryosleep by the Colonel and told that there's a mole inside the GDF, which is basically all the motivation she needs to get out there and start kicking all kinds of ass. We can't waste any time. On your feet, Harrison. And these earlier levels exploring this mostly abandoned facility in the height of some kind of lockdown and emergency is very similar to Gordon's escapades. In fact, there's even a random email on a computer terminal in that first level with the subject questionable ethics. Shortly after that, you're outside in a dusty canyon, which is instantly reminiscent of the surface tension and forget about Freeman chapters as well. And that visual theme of fighting military dudes with the backdrop of a desert is almost kind of synonymous with Half-Life's later chapters. Later on from that, you'll explore this large opened up forest area, which feels like a combination of Highway 17 and even Water Hazard, moving through different sewers and canals. I also got a bit of a Halo vibe from these bits too, with the way this Jeep controls and the machine gun on the back giving me flashbacks to driving around a Warthog. Plus I feel like the way that the mutant enemies constantly pick up physics objects to throw at Shelly is also similar to how the headcrab zombies worked in Half-Life 2, in the way that they'd whack nearby barrels or crates in Gordon's direction. Ow! There's a sequence launching a rocket, you've got a fight against a chopper on the side of a cliff, and you even head into a lab at one point to pick up an ion suit. Yeah, as opposed to a HEV suit. Welcome to the HEV Mark IV. Not to mention there's even an organic weapon that fires at homing insects, which recharges itself gradually over time. Oh, gross. Overall, these early levels just had that familiar ebb and flow to the level design and the combat, where navigation is more about observation, more than it is just moving in a linear direction. <laughs> Gotta keep your eyes open for things like vents you can crawl through, along with reading emails on computer terminals to find door codes. And there is a point to exploring all of this stuff too, because going off the beaten track is gonna get you extra ammo, along with much needed upgrading materials to buff up Shelly's weapons and abilities. The buck stops with me. There's even like a little bit of imsimming required here too. You know what I mean? Like moving around crates and getting creative with props to get past obstacles. There's not some kind of constant music track playing in the background either. And the sound design relies more on things like the ambient noise and the atmospheric effects, rather than just having this head banging tune blasting away constantly. Can't hold them off forever. What's the hold up? I mean, even the weapons are again broken down into different categories, with the crossbow again sharing the same slot as your automatic weapons. Oh yeah, and speaking of weapons too, like that starting pistol feels almost identical to the one from Half-Life 2. And I'm almost willing to bet my house on it that that reload animation is practically identical. They're the same picture. 
Even the way that the glass breaks when you shoot it looks kind of similar to how it worked in the Source engine. Wow, one egghead. Visually too, this is yet again another gorgeous looking game from Slipgate, and it truly captures the feeling that those late 90s and early 2000s shooters looked like. But then it manages to do it in a much more modern way, having all these various effects like volumetric lighting and dynamic shadows. The modeling and the texture work manages to be kinda basic but then also artistic. And I will say one thing too about this game along with Graven and Wrath, and that's that Slipgate have definitely got a consistent look going on with all three of these. They made the jump from 2.5D in Ion Fury to fully 3D here with Phantom Fury, and you can instantly tell you're in the same world and universe, with all of the weapons, the items and characters all feeling instantly familiar. There's a lot of really cool little incidental details with the engine as well, like being able to go around and interact with vending machines and keypads. I like it too how if there's an explosion indoors, it'll often set off the nearby fire sprinklers. And if you shoot the side of a fish tank without breaking it, you can see the water emptying out in real time. Impressive. Very nice. And yeah, like I know it's like a bit of a useless detail, but it's just something that makes the world feel far more believable. You can also consume food and drinks scattered around the environment to get back a little bit of health, and drink too much alcohol in a short amount of time, and the screen even starts to shake back and forth. About the only thing the whole thing's missing is manual saves, because for some reason this is another Slipgate title which uses checkpoints instead of hard saves. And again too, frustratingly, there's no kind of map screen either. Which ain't a huge issue in most of the levels, but it does become an issue in certain others. Especially the ones where you're exploring all of these complex facilities and environments with very similar looking rooms. Either way though, the first few hours of the campaign offer up some genuinely fun little sequences. Like being the third wheel in all these combat scenarios where the GDF is distracted by hostile mutants. Where you can pretty much choose when and how you want to join the fray. There's a neat sequence too, we can drop down an airstrike on a group of these guys who are all standing around in the middle of an open field. 200 feet to the east. Fire. And that train stage from the early demo makes a return as well and feels way more honed than it did before. Also proving yet again that train levels make the absolute best levels in video games. There's some very familiar looking weapons here too, like Shelly's Stun Baton, you got the Loverboy Revolver, Incendiary SMGs, Bowling Bombs, and eventually the Ion Bow. Hello again, old friend. And if you're at all familiar with Ion Fury, which, you know, chances are you're gonna be, then picking up these weapons is kind of like putting on a pair of comfy jeans, having more or less the exact same functions. I see you found your old friend. With the revolver, for instance, you can still lock onto multiple enemies at once for those quick draw headshots, which really is one of the most satisfying feelings in the game. Jesus. The Iron Bow's still got that really handy ultimate fire mode as well, which loads up a bunch of shots at once and then lets them all off in quick succession. And then the bowling bombs are those handy little grenades that roll across on the ground and home in on nearby enemies, even when they're hiding in cover or behind corners. Oh. At least, you know, that's the theory anyway, and I mean, here we are a bunch of games deep in the series, and these things still frequently shit the bed and refuse to work properly. New weapons include a pump action shotgun along with a super shotgun, which yeah is kind of cool and does a lot of damage, but it really just isn't that useful, mostly because of how long the reload time is. There's a basic assault rifle too, there's what's more or less a plasma rifle called the photon repeater, a plasma cannon and then finally the missile launcher. That's good stuff. So you're definitely not going to be left wanting there as far as the means to kill things. One of the new weapons I just don't understand though is something called the Foam Modulator, which fires out this kind of harmful goop that just has woeful range. I mean, honestly, I think I can piss further than this thing in real life. 
and I don't know if I'm just using it incorrectly or something. Like, maybe I'm supposed to be using it in conjunction with another weapon. But either way, man, it just kind of looked like I was spraying enemies down with fairy floss, and it seemed to do about as much damage. I do also appreciate, though, how you can detach minigun and grenade launcher turrets and carry those things around. The only other mechanics you get on the side of that is Shelly's new robotic arm, which comes with a couple of tricks. One being a powerful punch, and then the other, a shield. Now the punch is, you know, it's more or less what it sounds like. It's a move that locks onto a nearby enemy, punches them, and then does massive damage. And I will say as well that it has this weird effect of completely jibbing an enemy's body, but somehow managing to keep their head intact which results in this weird effect where their torso turns into mush, but then this very much still perfectly formed head just drops to the ground. And then the shield, which you first have to unlock, is again just, you know, what it sounds like, shielding you from incoming damage. Only this one really just seems kind of useless. Because while that shield is up, I mean, that's about all it really does. You can't fire back with any other weapons when it's activated, nor can you even, like, deflect bullets or anything like that. There is an upgrade for it that stops missiles, but you unlock that so late into the campaign that by that point, it's too little too late. And outside of a couple of instances when I had to use it to avoid turrets, it's really just a bit of a pointless mechanic. A lot of the upgrades for that ion suit are also just kind of pointless too. Like making it so armor and health pickups have a random chance to be doubled. Okay. Or another one that makes it so that sliding into objects is going to break them. I mean, yeah, that's useful. So as a result, you'll probably spend the most of these upgrade points on upgrading the weapons, which is where you can really spice things up with a bunch of ultimate fire modes. The pistol, for instance, can have an upgrade so that it fires in a burst mode, making it much more useful. And then the shotgun has what's easily one of the best features in the entire game, which is a flash that stuns enemies for a few seconds. The bowling bomb has a couple of different explosive methods, like a cluster mode that sends out mini bombs in different directions. So it's a cool way of adding a bit of customization to these guns and letting the player tailor their own loadout however they want to. I mean, it's not like any of them are entirely necessary to get through the game, but something like that bright flash on the shotgun, which stuns almost every single enemy type you come up against, really is just a massive advantage, especially considering the sheer amount of enemies you've got to contend with. And as for the shooting and the combat, like, I'd say the enemies in Phantom Fury aren't so much challenging as they are just overwhelming. If you break the whole thing down and observe how these enemies move around and react, their actual AI is pretty damn simple. It's only because there's often so many of them that it's easy to get stuck between a rock and a pile of shit. One at a time! And the difficulty there comes more from the fact that, you know, half a dozen of them suddenly all come rushing at you at the same time. Then if they're not running straight towards you, well, they're often just standing still somewhere shooting at you from a distance. Maybe throwing the occasional grenade your way, which really is about as advanced as they ever get. The melee enemies are really just the same couple of variants of mutants repeated over and over. Because yeah, man, I mean, that's pretty fun, hey, fighting the same basic enemy type 500 times. Like these idiots here who kind of look like that demon in Little Nicky who got a pair of tits put on his head. Oh, oh. Are there boobs on my head? Yeah, big ones. There's also these annoying little flying combat drones, which go down from literally one or two bullets, but then have the nasty side effect of exploding shortly after they're downed. Plus, they just couldn't help themselves, man, and they had to include those explosive kamikaze-style enemies. Because, yeah, like, that's something that just always improves the combat loop in a first-person shooter, isn't it? That was sarcasm, by the way. Probably the most annoying enemies, though, are these mutants who look a lot like Frankenstein's monster. And these guys are annoying because they leap towards you, which is an attack that you really can't ever really avoid. What?
And it got to the point where like every time I had a couple of these guys coming after me, I kept pressing the shift key almost out of habit to try to dash out of the way, which is obviously something I couldn't do because that's not a move in Shelly's arsenal. Yeah, but all she can do there is just jump and climb up ledges. Well, certain ledges anyway, because for some reason, most chest high objects are just completely unscalable. And then on the side of that, there's maybe like about four or five boss fights speckled throughout the campaign as well. None of which are really all that creative or clever and require little more than just shooting the damn things over and over until they go down. So most of the time where the shooting's concerned, you're just gonna be trading shots with a few different kinds of hostile soldiers working for the GDF. And there's really not much skill to any of it. You know, outside of making sure your crosshair is on something and just pressing the left mouse button. I don't think the shooting is actually hit scanning here, but the projectiles move so quickly that it may as well be anyway. And just like Half-Life, all the difficulty modes again seem to affect is enemy health points and how much damage they do. I mean, it's not like these guys become smarter or more adept, they just start to hit harder and they soak up more bullets before buying the farm. Which makes playing through this game on hard mode little more than just a bit of a pissing contest. It only gets harder from here. I mean, look, man, normally I have no issues with trying to beat these kind of games on the highest difficulties if the systems are there to allow for skillful play. But despite these creative environments and some cool sequences here and there, the rest of the shooting is just pretty barebones stuff. Nothing to lose. And in fact too, the more you play Phantom Fury, the more you really start to see the cracks, as what started out being an interesting and kind of enjoyable campaign really just starts to become tedious and monotonous and lacking any creative ideas. I mean, it starts becoming half-like and then just becomes half-baked. What? It's actually kind of amazing too, how a game that doesn't even seem to last all that long also somehow manages to go on for too long as well. And there's some areas in here where you will just be begging to see that end of level fade to black. Like an incredibly unexciting on-rail sequence inside a chopper, where you just aim with the mouse and shoot at other choppers until they explode. At certain times the environment collapses around you, but it's completely meaningless and has no tension whatsoever. Because you've got no control over where the chopper's actually going. Puzzles range from being painfully simple, like collecting key cards or reading computer terminals, but then other ones are so weirdly specific and vague that you'll be running around the same area for 15 or 20 minutes, just trying to figure out what you're supposed to be fucking doing. What is without a doubt though, one of the lamest puzzles in the entire game is the ones where you've got to use a claw crane to move boxes and crates around, often to create these makeshift platforms. And it's like, are we really stacking crates in 2024 here? Really? I mean, look, here's the thing, right? Physics puzzles back in like 2003 were interesting and fun because we'd literally never seen that kind of thing before. You know, so stacking cinder blocks on the side of a plank of wood so we could seesaw our way out of a ditch was a cool and fun concept. But the basic inclusion of a physics engine is about as household as apple pie these days. So having to move a bunch of crap around not once, not twice, but three fucking times, like, it ain't creative or enjoyable level design, man. It's just blatant filler. Where the campaign really starts to shit the bed, though, is the last few levels, and I would be very surprised if these levels are even truly completed. There's a plot twist about maybe two-thirds into the game, which really comes out of nowhere and makes no sense. And then from that point on is where it just feels like you're moving through levels that are about 80% finished. The level after this, for instance, has you destroying a submarine base, which requires blowing up three separate pylons with explosives. But for some reason, they thought it would be a good idea to only let you carry one explosive at a time. Which means that after planting a bomb, you need to run all the way back to the front of this area to pick up another one, before then running all the way back to the next pylon, all whilst dealing with constantly spawning in enemies the entire time. <laughs> Just what I needed. After that, you're trying to reach the surface by riding a mini sub, which is another completely challenge free and boring affair, where you shoot torpedoes at swimming schools of brain and spinal column enemies. I don't know, like, what else would you call these things? Well, what does that have to do with me? No, no. He's got a point. Before Shelly ends up on the streets of Chicago, where it suddenly looks a whole lot like Turbo Overkill, making her way through platoons of enemy soldiers on these hostile streets, where the whole thing just feels empty, barren, and repetitive, shooting the same two or three enemy types until it all just starts to become a blur. Don't lose your breath. 
It actually kind of reminded me of playing Deus Ex. You know, like when you'd be walking around one of those hub areas in Hell's Kitchen or Paris, where there was only like a handful of props around these otherwise uninhabited streets. Only that game came out like 20 years ago, man, and this is 2024. And I know you could probably say that it's the intent for these areas to be so barren, but they just come across as feeling incomplete, rather than that emptiness being like a deliberate design choice. There's a new mini boss type enemy that gets introduced here too, which when I first encountered it, instantly got stuck in between these two buses. You are a fucking idiot. And then they bring this thing back like another two or three times as well, which again, just feels like a lame way to slow down the player's progression. It's just like a massive turning point for the overall gameplay and all of the subtle world building the environmental detail and the pacing of those earlier levels is now just replaced by brainless, boring shooting. Moving from one street corner to the next and blowing away more dudes than your mum does on a Saturday night. Shit, sounds like a fun time. Oh yeah, and then there's that Blade cameo towards the end, which is just completely out of place as well. And look, I know it's just meant to be like a fun little reference, but it genuinely makes no sense as to why this guy shows up. I mean, as far as I know, it's never been established that he exists in the same universe as Shelly does. But more than that, like, does anyone even really know who this guy is to begin with? Save it for someone who cares, Winch. I mean, look, man, I'm not trying to gatekeep Sin, or act as if it's some kind of rare, obscure FPS that no one knows about. But I'd honestly wager that most people playing Phantom Fury have never even played Sin to begin with, and by extension, have no idea who this guy is. It just kind of feels like they threw him in there because they have the rights to the character, more so than including him because it actually made any kind of sense. And all he does is show up for like 10 or so seconds, give you his magnum pistol, and then disappear. Use this to send Greywater my regards. Oh yeah, and for some reason too, that pistol is now a fucking hand cannon, compared to the original game where it was, you know, just a pistol. Oh, I told you a new one, chump. Already got it. If nothing else, it was at least a nice little distraction, especially in comparison to how monotonous the rest of this campaign was. That's for sure. And by the time I'd come up to those final few boss encounters, I was really just in autopilot mode and waiting for the whole thing to come to an end, just so I could go downstairs and make myself some toast and have a cup of tea. Yeah man, the premise of black tea and buttered toast had officially become more exciting to me by that point than playing this game. Save it for someone who cares, Winch. This playthrough also came with the usual assortment of bugs and glitches that I've come to expect now from a game that very clearly hasn't been polished. Like boss fights not completing properly after I beat them and not letting me progress onto the next area. I also had really bad frame rate issues in certain levels as well, not to mention those few times the engine absolutely shit the bed and just propelled me into the air. I saw this already! There's also just like lazy technical shit too, like seeing enemies glitch through walls or solid objects. And I don't know either why all these bowling pins have zeros behind them either. What? Overall, the big question I had in my head the whole time I was playing through Phantom Fury was, why? Like, why does this game just even exist in the first place? Well, it can take some fiddling to get it started. I mean, look, dog, I love first-person shooters as much as the next bloke. In fact, I'd argue probably more than the next bloke. But were people really clamoring, you know, for a half-like shooter set in the Iron Fury universe? And one which doesn't even have any kind of resolution or closure ending with Shelly making some kind of weird remark about the future of the GDF before the whole thing just abruptly cuts to black. Well, oh, can never be too careful. Blade's cameo sums up the whole experience perfectly. Initially cool, exciting, and promising, soon replaced by a supreme feeling of just disappointment and wasted opportunity. Best of luck. While up in Phantom Fury, there's about 18 levels in total, which take varying amounts of time to get through. And I managed to beat the whole thing in around seven hours. But even still, like, in all those seven hours, I would genuinely struggle to think of any sequence or area that really impressed me. I don't know if I'd say that Phantom Fury was outright bad or any kind of dumpster fire, but it really is just like a bit of a sad conclusion to what should have been a solid trifecta of shooters coming out of Slipgate Ironworks. And I can't help but feel that this is ultimately just going to be a bit of a swan song for the company. I mean, I don't see them making any more first-person shooters anytime soon. I don't know, man. Shelly Harrison deserved better. 3D Realms deserved better. We all deserved better. But hey, like, if you've got nothing else going on and need to kill seven or eight hours, well, could be a lot worse, I guess. Hi.